questions 1 to 4. You Hello there, you must be Jane. Please come in. My name is Mrs Dunstan. Hello, Mrs Dunstan. Pleased to meet you. All right, now, let's see. Now, you're interested in attending university in Canada, is that right? Yes, and I have a lot of questions to ask you. OK, but before I begin to answer your questions, I need to ask you a few questions first. Now, your major is... Engineering. Mechanical engineering. Right, and where did you graduate? I graduated from the Beijing Institute of Machinery in July 1998. I completed my bachelor's degree. OK, now I'm assuming you'll want to continue studying in that field, am I right? Actually, I'd prefer to do an MBA if possible. But if I have no other choice, then I'll continue in mechanical engineering. OK, now are you familiar with the requirements for an MBA degree? Yes. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. I think I need to do well on the GMAT, and I'll definitely need the TOEFL or IELTS, right? That's right. You'll need at least 600 on the TOEFL, or 6.5 on IELTS. In addition, you need to have completed a bachelor's degree too. Did you take the GMAT yet? No, but I plan to take it in August. The requirements for a master's degree in engineering are a little different. You'll need to take the GRE and, of course, the TOEFL or IELTS. I see. And when do I start to apply? The best time to start the application process is in November or December of the year prior to your intended year of study. Application forms are usually available in September or October. Which schools in Canada offer the MBA degree? Of the approximately 50 universities in Canada, 20 offer an MBA Here's a small booklet summarising Canadian university programmes. You'll find all the information on page 22. Great. Thanks. And how about tuition and scholarships? Tuition for MBA programmes has been steadily increasing. Some universities now charge the full tuition, meaning that there is no government subsidy. Those universities cost about $10,000 per year, and it's a two-year programme. Other universities are still government subsidised, so the tuition is only about $4,500 per year. In terms of scholarships, usually the top five students entering the MBA programme are given a generous scholarship. All other students have to pay the full fees. International students have to pay the full tuition. That's $10,000 per year. Oh, is it very difficult to get into an MBA programme? Yes. In fact, the competition is very strong. MBA graduates have a pretty easy time finding a job, so many students are eager to do the programme thinking it will guarantee them success in their careers. Well, it sure does sound like an excellent way to start a promising future. Um, what is the school year like? Classes begin in September each year and finish before Christmas. They resume after New Year and finish at the end of April. And after April? Why, that's your summer holiday. Sounds great. I want to thank you, Mrs. Dustin, for all your help. I really do appreciate it. You're very welcome. And if you have any other questions, please feel free to contact me. You know my number, right? I sure do. Thanks very much. Goodbye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part two. Part two. We'll hear part of a talk given by a member of staff at a hospital. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Hello and welcome to the homepage for the Healthy Hearing Medical Clinic and Surgery, where we'd like to share a little more information about the services we provide and more. Our hospital is one of the leading specialised hospitals in the United Kingdom attracting the very best healthcare professionals from around the globe. Not only are we a leading medical practice, but we are also the only hospital in the United Kingdom dedicated entirely to the treatment of and research into the curing of hearing loss. Our facilities and staff here are renowned across Europe, attracting thousands of patients a year. Our consultations can number anything up to 11,000 patients a year. However, we aim to treat around 5,000 patients a year so as to maintain and ensure the quality of our services. Our patients are guaranteed the highest standard of care, as well as the use of our first-class facilities. All patients requiring overnight treatment are provided with their own private room with ensuite facilities as well as a state-of-the-art entertainment centre, which includes a flat-screen LCD television and PlayStation. Appointments with our healthcare professionals can be made at any time during the week, with female doctors available between 8am and 11am. If you need to see a doctor outside of these times, please visit the Out of Hours page of our website for more information. Our doctors are all trained to an exceptionally high standard and practice a vast array of specialities. Mr Roberts is a fully qualified ear and throat specialist. Mr Edwards is a paediatric hearing specialist, while Mr Green specialises in reversing hearing loss. For more details about our people, please visit the staff members page on our website. During a consultation, doctors will sometimes decide medication is required, for which patients should receive a prescription. There are several pharmacies within the city. However, we recommend that patients use the pharmacy housed within our healthcare facility. Our in-house pharmacy is well stocked at all times. Our products are competitively priced, and our pharmacists are on hand to help and advise from 8 a.m. until 10 p.m. from Monday to Saturday and from 9 a.m. until 12 p.m. on Sundays. If you require any help outside of these hours, please see our Out of Hours page on the website. Since the Healthy Hearing Medical Clinic and Surgery also functions as a teaching hospital, we aim to provide our students with every opportunity to expose themselves to medicine in practice. Therefore, we would like to encourage our patients to give their consent for a medical student to attend their consultations. If our patients are not comfortable with this, there will be a form at reception where patients will be able to opt out. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Now, please look at the map I've given you of the Healthy Hearing Medical Clinic and Surgery. 
For those not familiar with our practice, reception can be found through the main door at the end of the corridor. If your consultation is booked with Mr. Green, you need to go through the main door and turn right by the nurse's desk, and his office is at the end of the corridor on your left hand side. If you need to alter any of your personal details, please visit our secretary at the Office for Medical Records, which you will find next to the therapy room. If you're awaiting surgery, please first check in with reception before taking the first door on the right after you enter the clinic. Finally, in the event that you feel disappointed with any of the services we have provided or have any further questions, please locate our manager's office, which can be found near the office for medical records and between two closets. If you have any more questions about the Healthy Hearing Medical Clinic and Surgery, please do not hesitate to contact us on 01256 111 That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. Maria is a student at university. She has handed the first draft of an essay to her tutor. The tutor has read it, and now they are discussing ways the essay can be improved. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 21 to 25. Well, Maria, I have to say I was quite impressed by your essay. <laughs> it's a big improvement on the last one. Really? I'm glad. I put a lot more work into this one. I really spent ages on it. Mm. And it shows. You've addressed most of the problems I pointed out last time. In particular, the style and language are much more appropriate for an academic essay. So that aspect is OK? Absolutely. If you carry on like this, you shouldn't have any significant problems in that department. That's a relief. I've been quite worried about that, although I've been reading a lot of other essays to try to get the right style. Well, I'd say you've been successful. There are just one or two minor things you could look at, uh, your punctuation's quite basic. It's really just full stops and commas. And parentheses. Brackets? Y yes, brackets if you prefer. In academic writing, these are best used only occasionally, if at all. You use them rather too often. OK, I see. And uh, I'm sorry to mention it, but your spelling. I know, I know. But I'm working on a foreign computer. The spell checker doesn't work for English. Are you sure? Have you tried changing the setting to English? No, I haven't. Well, I should see if that's possible. I haven't marked you down this time, but, well, some of my colleagues are a bit old-fashioned about spelling. I'd try to get that sorted out if I were you. OK, I understand. I'll try to change the setting. Hmm. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30.
Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. The only major problem I have with the content of your essay is the introduction. Oh. The introduction should, well, introduce the theme of the essay. Mm. You've put some of the most important points there. <laughs> For example, this bit. Um, yeah, the statistics about the growth of railways in the 1850s. That really should go in the main body of the essay. Ah. And so should this paragraph about changes in patterns of employment. In general, I'd say your introductory section should be no more than half as long as it is at the moment. Mm, OK. And I should move those points forward? Precisely. And going back to the railways, they're one of the most significant factors for change in this period. Mm. But apart from those statistics in the introduction, you only briefly mention them. Ah. I'd like to see a lot more on that and the influence the expansion of the railways had on patterns of social and economic behaviour. You mean how with the railways people could travel to find work and could meet people from other areas? E exactly. Then in the midsection, well, it's not a big thing, but this quotation from the Times. You think it's too long? <sighs> well, you said it. <laughs> I, I couldn't think of a way to shorten it. Do you think it's really necessary? You mean I could just get rid of it? Yes. You've already made the point and backed it up with other evidence. The quotation's redundant, really. OK. Well, that'll be easy. There were various other minor points, uh, which I've noted in the margins. Mm. You can look at those later. But moving forward to the end here, I wasn't quite sure what this meant. The final paragraph? Yes. Are you saying that, on the whole, the changes of the mid-19th century tended to improve the lives of ordinary people or not? It's not very clear. Mm, it's not? No, it isn't. I'd add a few lines clarifying your position. OK. When do you want the final draft? No, uh, the end of term will be fine. Um, but there was just one other thing, the bibliography. Did you really read all these books? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> Just the books you actually consulted will be fine. You don't need to include everything ever published on the subject. <laughs> right. OK. Thanks. Bye. Goodbye. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a talk on the research of architecture. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Welcome class to your very first lecture in this series on architecture conducted by myself, Dr Torben Dahl. Today we will be looking into the relationship between climate and architecture where I will be giving you a critical overview of the main climate influences that shape the design of buildings. Throughout this lecture series, we will be looking at the latest research into climatic design carried out by experts in the field, in addition to case studies and examples drawn from modernist practice, both in cities 
and rural areas. Now, acid rain is one of the climatic elements with the most devastating effects on our architecture. The chemicals in acid rain can cause paint to peel, corrosion of steel structures such as bridges, and erosion of stone statues. Since the 1970s, our government has been making great effort to reduce the release of these chemicals into the atmosphere, with positive results. Private organizations have also been raising awareness and funds, and recently received a huge donation from the bank. It is interesting to look at the studies that have been carried out into the effects of acid rain at varying altitudes. Research has shown that there are lower levels of acid in the damaging pollutants at higher altitudes, meaning that skyscrapers are much less vulnerable to the negative effects as they are exposed to acid rain with far lower levels of damaging pollutants. Recently, the ALTA project was founded to carry out further research into acid rain. This project is directed towards studying the effects of acid rain on old, traditional buildings of stone construction that are vulnerable to damage caused by acid rain. Masonry is particularly vulnerable as it is easily corroded and weakened by the acidic chemicals. It is imperative that we protect these buildings as they are valuable examples of our history and culture. Pollution is one of the main sources of concern in the present day. The construction industry contributes considerably as a source of pollution in its day-to-day -day processes of creating building materials such as concrete and glass. However, more new sustainable methods are being developed to counter this. A recent case study for this is Sky Tower, whose windows have been made from recycled glass to prevent pollution from the glass-making process. Water is the most problematic element to be considered in construction. It is imperative that construction elements, such as the insulation, are fitted into the building in dry weather to prevent it from getting wet. This makes winter an undesirable season for construction, as the heavy rainfall can have adverse effects on the building. Another climate type that has an enormous effect on buildings is humidity. Constructions made of steel and stone are largely unaffected by humidity. However, it can have a serious effect on wooden constructions if the timber has not been correctly treated. Moisture from the air can condense in the grain of the wood, which then swells and shrinks in proportion to the magnitude of change in its moisture content. This variation in size can have disastrous consequences. In areas of the world that are prone to earthquakes, certain design and environmental conditions are preferable for protecting buildings in the event of a tremor. Engineers have come up with numerous building procedures to help minimize shaking in buildings. For example, tall buildings have height restrictions and counterweights and multi-storey buildings have reinforced floors and walls. Ground conditions are a cause for worry in many constructions, as often the soil is of the wrong density to protect the foundations. Luckily, technology has now been developed that can help to minimise damage by earthquakes. Seismic sensors can give prior warning when an earthquake is about to happen, so that preparations can be made to protect both the people and the buildings from harm. The movement of building structures can now also be measured and monitored over time by architects. It has been expressed by architects within the design community that it would be valuable to be given special courses for designing buildings within earthquake zones. Guidelines are also expected to be produced by the government in the near future that will give architects a universal checklist to follow. That wraps up the lecture for today. Please remember that attendance is mandatory. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
I've got an itch I can't scratch, I'm missing a piece that completes a whole part of me, an open wound scar to see. Everybody come here, gather round, welcome to the freak show, the best in town. What the hell's wrong with me? I don't get along with anybody, honestly. I've been living in my own head constantly, thoughts jumbled round, think I need a new lobotomy. Wait, all these thoughts are too negative. I don't wanna get lost in the sedative. Gotta show them what I got, I'm competitive. You know I'm about to go off, I won't let them win, I'll take a stab. I wanna chase a bag, I wanna way, I can change all the things I lack. I gotta face the facts, I gotta taste and knack. Got me obsessed with the rest, I got an itch to scratch. Ah!